Okay, this is chapter one, Foundations of Government um, Lecture. So, the three essential questions for this chapter are, why does government matter? How are different forms of government categorized? And what are the ideas and principles that characterize American government? At the, I'm sorry, American democracy. At the end of this chapter, you should be able to answer these three essential questions. So let's get started here. Um, features of a state and the theories of how, about the origin of a government. So this first objective, um, we're going to find out what a state is and how states originated. So a state, a community that occupies a defined territory, has an organized government, and the power to make and enforce laws. If you think about it, um, the United States of America is a state, has a defined territory, has a government that can, has the power to make and enforce local laws. Um, the state of Nevada is a state. It's a community that has a defined territory and has a government that can make and enforce laws. So a state is not necessarily states like you think of the 50 states in the United States. The states can be a country as well. Canada is a state. Um, Mexico is a state. All the European countries are different states. Every country is a state in essence. They all have a community that has a defined territory and has a government that can make and enforce laws. So when you think of state, it's not necessarily state how you think of the 50 states of America, but countries are also states. A continent is not a state. So North America is not a state. So let's be clear with that. Um, a nation, however, is a little bit different than a state. These are people who are united by either race, language, customs, or religion. Um, an example of this would be Israel or um, Israeli or Jewish people. Um, these are people that have a common race, they have a common language and customs, and they especially have a religion that they all have in common as well. Um, one example that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't have a religion aspect to it would be um, British people or um, French people or Italians. They all have a common race, language, customs or traditions, but not necessarily a religion that goes with them. Those would be that's those would be more of, that's a nation. Um, maybe some of you guys. I'm part of the Rebel Nation. I'm a big Rebel UNLV fan, and um, people who are Rebel fans, I have a I have common custom and traditions with them. I don't, may not have the same race or language as all Rebel fans or not, but um, we do have some customs and traditions we may have, like going to Rebel games, cheering for them. But uh, anyways, that's what a nation is. It's different than a state. A state is a, a occupied territory with a government where a nation is this group of people who have these common ties either by race, language, or custom. So it's good to know the difference between these two um, terms here. We move along. So now that we know what a state is, um, there are four features that make up a state. The first feature of a state is population. Okay, If a state has doesn't have people in it, then it's really not really, I guess there's really, the basis of every state has to have a population. You must have a population in order to even have a state. The second part of that is a territory. Another feature is a territory. Um, state of Nevada, we have a defined territory boundary. You know, you look at a map, you can see it. It's, um, we border California and Utah, Arizona, Idaho, and um, Oregon as well. So we have a defined territory of what that is. The United States of America, border Canada, Mexico, and the two oceans. Defined territory or boundaries that have been established. Okay, so that's one that's the second feature of a state. The third one is sovereignty, which means basically absolute authority within those boundaries. And having the power to make laws. That's what sovereignty means. Um, for instance, in the classroom, I have sovereignty within that territory. Within that territory of the classroom, I have complete power to make policies or laws, you want to, whatever you want to call them, in the classroom itself. Sovereignty. The, the, the governor of Nevada has supreme absolute authority within the power, the boundaries of the state of Nevada to make, um, to, to, in the power to make laws. Well, him and the, our state assembly can. Same thing with the President of the United States. President and Congress, together, they have absolute authority within the boundaries of the United States to make laws itself. So that's the third feature of a state. The fourth one is government itself, having institutions to maintain order. 
and provide services and enforce these decisions on the citizen itself. So, not only do you, does the state have a population, group of people, or territory within those people live in or are bound within, um, they have a government that has the, so the sovereignty and power to, to provide services for us and put those decisions, find those decisions on the, the citizen itself. Um, we have, so one institution can be law enforcement. They maintain this social order. Um, another institution could be Parks and Recs. I love that show, Parks and Recs. But they provide a service. They provide parks for the community to play or have picnics or take your dogs to a dog park. Um, whatever it may, they provide a service. And these government institutions also have the power to make laws. They have sovereignty, sovereignty to make laws and enforce those. So, you know, like the, even though I have the right, the public, I have a right to go to a dog park, uh, when I walk my dog around, I, I they've been, they've passed laws that enforce me to make me um, have a rabies tag or walk him on a leash, my dog on a leash. So, institutions that maintain this order for us are the or is the fourth feature of a state itself. So we know what a state is. We know we define what a state is. We know the features of a state. What makes up a state? How did states originate? Or how do they come about? Well, there are four main theories of how these states developed over time. Um, the first one is called evolutionary theory. Um, basically, gradually over time, from a family or extended kinship, these groups of people expanded and basically kind of formed a state of themselves. So Israel is a really good example of this. Abraham, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, um, or the father, or be the father of the, of the Israel nation, and you know, over time, his his kinship, his extended family, has grown, grown, and grown, and, we, and it has developed to what we have today, which is Israel. So evolutionary theory, just family developed over time. Um, another theory out there, how state was by force. Basically, individual or groups of people use force to make enough people submit to their authority. Um, I really can't think of a good example of force theory, but go with it. And then the third one is divine right theory. Basically, a state was founded by a god or gods, and the ruler possesses this divine right to rule. And so an example of this would be Egypt. Pharaohs were given this divine right. They were thought of as gods that, um, because they were gods, they were given this power to rule over the people. And that's how the state of Egypt um, has developed over time. Well, originally started that way. They don't have pharaohs anymore. But anyways, divine right. Um, or even like kings. Kings and queens, they, they may, they have, um, they were given this divine right by a god, div some form of divinity. The fourth theory is a social contract theory. Um, oops, sorry, go back. So what a social contract theory is, basically the people um, have this contract with the government, and by doing so, they surrender some of their power to this authority and return for security. And the man who comes up with this theory is named Thomas Hobbes. He's an English philosopher who, who like I, who are the, which is like I just said, people surrender their, their power, some power, not all the power, to this authority, this government, in order to maintain or to protect them from other groups of people, let's say. Um, so that's Thomas Hobbes' theory. But another um, English philosopher named John Locke he took this theory to another level. Um, what he said was, if the government prevail, failed to preserve the, these rights or they, they broke this contract, this social contract that they've agreed to, then those people have the right to break that contract they, that they had an agreement with. Um, Thomas Hobbes wouldn't be, wouldn't like this. He would, he wouldn't basically, he would basically say you couldn't break this contract um, that John Locke says. Um, but John Locke says you do have every right to break the contract if you feel that there is a need to do so. And think about it, the United States of America, which of these theories is how, is how the, the origin of our state developed? If you think about it, um, it's, we have a social contract, and our original contract was with, 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 was with British, and we, our founding fathers, read and knew about John Locke, and they agreed with his philosophy, and they felt like the contract they had with Britain 
was no longer acceptable and they weren't they were they failed to preserve the rights that they felt like they had and so they broke the contract and started a new social contract um, with the American people and you know that's how we have the Declaration of Independence that's where we broke away from Britain and all that stuff so estates originate from either one of these four ways um, America what is a social contract theory is that's our, that is the way our country originated um, I'm not going to read the Declaration of Independence, but if you were, you, you, if you do read the Declaration of Independence, you will see that um, our founding fathers were basically writing about how they felt like their rights were being broken and they are going to break away from Great Britain. This is why they're declaring their independence. Okay, so we know what a state is. We, um, we know how states developed or originated over time now. So once a state has originated and developed, um, they have to form some type of government. That's one characteristic of a state is having a sovereignty or government institution. So this objective is distinguished to the similarities and differences between a unitary, federal, and I should have confederate governments in there as well. But So we're going to look at these three systems of government. The first system is a unitary system of government, which all the key power is given to one um, central government or one authority, the national government. This is kind of like, uh, so or an example, this would be like the United Kingdom or Japan. Um, their power is concentrated and the regional governments around the national government, um, they carry out the decisions given to them by the central government. So it's kind of like if, you know, if we were put into a, if we had a unitary system here in America, it would be as if the president and the Congress, the Supreme Court, they basically told the states, all the regional governments, like our states, our local governments, um, they would tell them what, how to carry out laws and rules and stuff like that. Um, so all key powers given to the national government. That's a unitary system of government. Second type of system is a federal system of government, which is what America is today, not originally, but today we are a federal system where... It's divided up. The national government has power. The state government has powers. Um, some of them they share. Some they don't share. Some of the national government. Some powers only the national government has. Some powers only the states have. And it's divided up. So the United States is a good example of this. Um, all levels of, of the have, all levels of government have power to make their own laws, elect officials, and create agencies. Um, so, like for example, I like I'll just use a park. I've been watching a lot of Parks and Rec lately. Um, you know, we have our city parks, but the national government does not tell the city of Las Vegas how to run or set up their parks. But then our national government also has parks. Well, we have, we have national parks. Like in Nevada, we have the Great Basin National Park. Um, that was all planned and developed by the national government, not by the state of Nevada. It's just in the state of Nevada. So it's a good example of how our government is divided. They divide the powers up in some, all levels of government has these different types of powers to do things on their own. So that's divided federal system of government. The third type is a confederal system. Um, this is where states join together, and then they kind of tell the central government what to do. It's a reversal of the unitary system of government. We're a uni unitary system of government. Sorry, not universal, unitary system of government. They kind of tell that it's a top-down flow of government power. Um, the national power tells the states what to do. In a confederal, it's reversed. The states kind of tell the national power, national government what to do. And originally, the United States was under a confederate system of government. When we had the Articles of Confederation, when we originally broke away from Britain, this is the type of government, system of government, I should say, that we had. Um, it didn't work out. It was not really, it wasn't really good. We broke away, you know, wrote a new constitution, started again. So, um, not a lot of countries have this form of government, but uh, an example of a modern one would be the European Union, where these different Euro European countries have joined together and they kind of delegate powers to limited powers to the the EU, the European Union, um, which is over those those countries in Europe. So that's a modern version example of a confederal or confederate system of government. All right, so the United States is a federal system government. 
Originally a confederate, we changed, now we're a federal system of government. And within these systems of government, you have types of governments that you can choose from, or that a nation can, a nation or a state can become. Um, so what are the major types of government? Well, there are four major types of government. One is an autocracy, where one person is in power. Um, an example of an autocracy would be a totalitarian dictatorship like Cuba or um, um, South. I'm sorry, North Korea, where the single leader of those countries they make all decisions for um, both socially and economic life of the people in those countries or states. Um, the second type of government would be a monarchy, where power is inherited. Um, down from one person to the, to the next and you know most people think of England um, but another more modern example of this would be um, Jordan because uh, in Jordan their, their king actually is in, the, is in control they have power um, over the whole country where England is a more is a constitutional monarchy where they have power but the real power is actually another branch of government and in England it is the Parliament, which is kind of like our Congress, and um, they actually have the real power. The monarchy in England is just more for show and um, don't have much power at all. So monarchy, power that is inherited, second type of government. The third type is an oligarchy, where a small group of people hold the power itself. Um, this seed, like South Africa used to be an olig oligarchy. The small group of people that held power were the whites. They were the minority in South Africa. I mean, yeah, South Africa, the country South Africa. And um, and uh, they ran and controlled um, the government there. That has since changed. It's no longer that way. But in all these small group of people that hold power, an example of this could be a theocracy. So it's not just a group of people. It could be like the whites or race. It could be military-wise. Or it could be a theocracy based on a religion, and Iran is a theocracy. The country of Iran is a theocracy where their religion, Islam, a lot of the laws are passed based on the religion doctrine of Islam. So again, theocracy, small group of people that hold power. Now, the United States, we have a democracy, um, which means ruled by people, um, or majority rules. Democracy, majority rules. So, there are different types of democracies, and um, one type of democracy is a direct democracy where people govern themselves by voting on, on, the issue, on the issues individually as citizens. Now, we don't have a direct democracy on all levels of government. Again, we have a federal system of government, divided power. On a national level, you, could, you can't, I mean, could you imagine voting on every issue that's um, before Congress by the people of the United States? If we were to do that, it would take forever to get anything done. Laws would, would, would be voted on in a very slow manner. So we don't have a direct democracy on a national level, but on local level, we do. Um, you know, last election, um, we could have voted for um, maybe building a stadium. Um, that's something that the individual people like, say, Las Vegas could vote on if they want to build, if they want the government to build raise taxes, or somehow finance a stadium by the city. So that would be a direct democracy. So on a local level, we do have direct democracy. But on a national level, we don't. We have, a, what we, we have representatives that go off and represent us in Congress. And then those people who we elect are going to make decisions, um, hopefully that reflect our opinions. So democracy, ruled by people, or, or majority rules, I like that better majority rules um, and we have a democratic republic basically people we elect people to represent us so of the systems of government we have a federal system of government and then type of government within the, the federal system is a democracy or democratic republic um, government all right so since we are a democracy what is what makes up a democracy um, one thing and then democracy is individual liberty, the, the, the power or the, the ability to choose 
lot of there's a lot of different things we can do. We choose individual. We have that individual power and liberty to do um, a lot of different things. Where we live, where we go to school, where we eat. Um, a lot of freedoms when it comes to democracy. Um, second characteristic is majority rule. When we elect or we vote on different things, it's not. It's based on majority. If fifty-one percent or more of the people agree to to that issue or wanted something passed, then it's passed. Uh, the law is passed, so the um, issue is resolved that way. If it's less than fifty percent, then it doesn't. It just stays the same. So majority rules. Third is having free elections. Um, to have free elections, there's a couple things you need to have in order to have a, a true free election. Um, one of those is having every vote weigh the same. One vote doesn't equal two votes. One, you know, my vote is just as my vote is just as um, weighs just as much as the president's vote, whoever he votes for. So every way, every vote weighs the same. You can express your views freely. The candidates who are running. Um, when you watch TV ads or, or videos or speeches or uh, debates, the candidates are free to say however, you know, express themselves freely, however they believe on whatever issues it may be they're um, being asked about. Third one, citizens help candidates. In a free election, you got to have people who help the candidates get elected. Um, and there are a number of ways how you can do that. You can either you know, answer phone calls or call people. You can donate. You can put buttons on. You can put signs in your yard. Um, multiple ways the citizens can help a candidate win an election. The fourth characteristic of election, free election, is having very little limited voting requirements. In the United States, really, all you need is uh, to be 18 and not have a criminal record that um, expels you from voting. And basically, that's it. So it's very minimum here in the United States. Some can argue you may we may need more restrictions but um, a true free election would have very little restrictions itself on who can and who can't vote and then I think this last one is having secret ballots uh, when I vote no one knows who I was and who I vote I mean they know who I voted for but they don't know who that was that voted for that person so secret ballot and then a fourth characteristic is having political parties competing which is good because if you had only one party um, you're always going to get the same same um, type of people in power. Having complete um, two parties or more that have different views is um, a good characteristic of a democracy. That Again, it goes back to individual liberty and tr freedom and choosing between different types of um, ideas. Oh, sorry, the, so those are characteristics. And then the principles of a democracy here in America is... Um, worth of the individual basically people are created equal and everyone has deserves the right to have um, to pursue their potentials second one is having a rule is a rule of law um, if there was no rule of law basically if the law was a joke and no one followed it then we would have no order and we would not have um, basically no there be there be chaos so the government being giving the government the authority to enforce laws or limits to the people is is a good principle of a democracy. Third one is majority minority rights. Um, majority rules, but the rights of the minority are also protected. Um, people, including those in the minority, are um, protected. Um, let's see here. Even though you're in the minority, you can still express your opinions, and you know later on down the road, maybe things will change, and you become the majority just by your your hard work of trying to change people's minds so minority rights majority rights is a good thing um, another key principle is compromise despite having differences um, opposing groups can still reach agreements um, this is what happens in in our government today we have republicans and democrats and they have to work together to come to compromise to get things done or passed um, which is good because you're having both points of views being represented and um, infused into laws that get passed and that have, that, have, that eventually affect you, the citizen. And the last one is having participation, citizens that participate. You know, this is really probably the, the biggest principle of a democracy, is people who participate in government. Without it, um, really, our, our government is 
free to do what they want to do. They don't have the people to check them and keep them on on the right course or um, doing the things we really elected them to do. So having um, citizen participate is really one of the, probably the biggest keys to uh, um, democracy itself. And there's a number of ways to do that. You can vote, you can run for office, you can campaign for people, you can answer phone calls, you can get involved um, financially. So uh, there's tons of ways of, of participating, r protesting, going to rallies, um, all different ways of participating in an in the elections or in democracy itself. All right, let's see here. I think this is the last part here. Um, free enterprise, what is it and how is it important to a democracy? So what free enterprise means is opportunity to control your own economic decisions. Um, you know, your parents have the opportunity to control uh, how much they want to spend for schooling. They could either send you to faith and have you pay money and pay money for that, or they can um, go to public school. So you can buy this car or that car. You can buy this phone or this phone. Um, you have opportunity to control your own economic decision. You can spend more money and save more money. So that's what a free enterprise is, a system is, the opportunity to control your own um, economic decisions. Um, the reason why this is important to, to American democracy is that it allows people to build wealth, and having that ability to build wealth is going to, let, is going to limit the government um, from getting involved, really. Um, a free market, in a free market or free enterprise, basically they're the same things. Um, if it's left alone, individuals and businesses will compete with each other to offer better products at lower prices. And um, when the, those who succeed in this competition, they will prosper. And in, in turn, they will benefit society and the economy overall. Um, now, over time, the government, the United States government, has often found it necessary to interfere in the economy and Today, we really have a mixed market economy where the government does play a role in our economy. Um, so it's not we don't have a true free enterprise system here in America. Um, it's more of a, a balance between, between the government involvement and also f free enterprise as well. And I think that's it for this chapter. So uh, basically here, um, I guess I'll go back to my... To original central questions. Um, so, why does government matter? Um, how are different forms of government categorized? And the ideas and principles behind American democracy. I hope that you um, can answer those questions. Thank you.